Well, um, I got this one dream, which was a very long dream. When I woke up, I could remember every single word of it. I could remember it so vividly. A lot of it, I did not at the time that I had it, understood it. But as time wore on, the Lord revealed it all to me. I was going through great persecution because of a lot of lies that were told on me by other people and repeated. And I think there was probably at, at least 20 culprits were involved in this uh, in different ways. This one went out like a, a root of evil, and then this one went out that way. And, it, and they went in every part of my life and caused me great persecution. And every bit of it from beginning to end was a lie. What turned people against me and caused them to curse me, it was all a lie. Now, while I was going through it, I never looked at it. While I was going through it, I was very, very blessed because Jesus, I had already died to self and Jesus lived within me so much that nothing could shake me off of loving others. No matter what was said, no matter what was done, my heart never held one thing against anybody. Never held it to sit down and say, well, they're going to get theirs and God's going to take care of it. No matter what they did, and, and believe me, some of these people tried to kill me. I'm not telling you stories, I'm telling you a truth. And they tried to kill me in more ways than one. And so sometimes when I know people are praying against me, I tell them, I've had greater ones than you, better men than you, better women than you. It tried to destroy and kill me. Stronger, more powerful. And I'm innocent. I'm innocent in whatever you think or you feel. And you need to be careful of what you're doing. So anyway, at the time that I got this vision, and even now, I'm not a scholar. I have not memorized certain scriptures in like I don't take a whole psalm and memorize it from beginning to end uh, I know most of it where I go into the word and I and I read what God is saying to me through that word but to bring it out of my own memory from memorization it's just not there to bring it out out of, out of my imagination it's not there because I didn't put it there like that but it does come out through the Spirit of God. I will never forget this uh, dream as long as I live. I lived in a certain a, uh, area when there was about 20 or 25 people that had persecuted me so badly everywhere I went. Even strangers were cursing me. And I was dying at the time of cancer. I, I went through so much. But that wasn't the point. The point was, is I wasn't asking God for deliverance. You, you think I did, but I didn't. I didn't ask God to heal me. Other people did. I didn't ask God to change one thing about me. I didn't ask God to move these people out of the way, even though I knew what they were doing. I never looked at it. When, it, when God revealed it to me, I just turned my head and would never think about it. I just focused on serving God and loving God, the one that died for me. I didn't care about anything else. Like Paul the Apostle said, all I care about is Jesus and him crucified. So therefore, there was nothing in me, no matter what you did or said, to hold against you. And through the years of the different manifestations of the things that were happening, I didn't know until years and years later who were the people that started it, who the, uh, so therefore it couldn't have been because of me these things happened to them. I, I knew nothing. 
And I didn't care. I, I really didn't. For God was holding my hand so tightly and teaching me so much that there was no trade-off. There was nothing in this entire life that could tempt me to not listen to him, to not obey him. He said not to judge. I didn't judge. He said not to touch. I didn't touch. He said not to do a lot of things. And I obeyed God according to my knowledge, according to my understanding, according to all that he worked with me, gave me, and did for me. You see, it didn't matter what you thought of me. It didn't matter if you thought I was right or if you thought I was wrong. And if I was not like you, many hated me because I was nothing like them. So <clears throat> what did that matter to me? It didn't mean a thing except for their own souls, for their sake. Sure, I prayed. But here's the thing. I didn't pray for my sake. I didn't pray for my will. I didn't ask God to even protect me. He just was there always to protect me, even when they tried to kill me, even when, when, uh, and I can't even explain to you the situations and circumstances where it very easily could have gone the wrong way, except I had God. So I want to give you an understanding of how God does give dreams and he does give visions. And with this dream, I had a vision almost immediately afterwards. And, uh, and I saw the end result of what the dream was about. And the dream was word for word, verse by verse, the King James Version of Psalm 18. I saw God in the heavens tramping out whoever made themselves an enemy to him. I saw him going over the across the earth just like this, just going like that, and just tramped every last thing out. And then at the end of the dream, and, and, and as he was doing it, an angel was giving each verse of Psalm 18. And when I woke up, and I almost couldn't tell that it was a vision, I saw myself leaving that whole area being completely delivered out of there, going just literally going through the air, just just like this. I saw that happening. And uh, not understanding what God was trying to say to me, except that he was going to deliver me. And, and I wasn't even looking for deliverance. I was living one day at a time, striving to be the Christian I was supposed to be, to accept the persecution that I was going through, to live with it. And many, many times, I literally wanted to die. Many times, my flesh would scream at the top of my lungs for God to kill me because I could not take the persecution from everyone. Now, I only went through it with every neighbor, every both sides of the family, every person in my life was lying on me. And they took a certain amount of the truth and twisted it to suit themselves to enable them to do what they did. But it was still a lie. And perfect strangers <laughs> would curse me because of it. But I still never did I ever Hold it. In my heart, Jesus was so real that when these people were doing it, all I wanted to do was put my arms around them and say, don't you know that I love you? Can't you see that I do love you? Even, even the ones I didn't know. That was the love of God inside of me for them saying, can't you see? It was Jesus saying, can't you see I love you? But if you read Psalm 18, you will see 
what God said that he would do to deliver his own. And I had written to somebody at one time and told them, if you read Psalm 18 and you are giving God all the glory for your life and you are living the way he wants you to, then you can claim that God will deliver you through something like Psalm 18. But if you are using it as your vendetta, as, as your uh, whatever, to revenge to prove that you've got God and God's not with them, anyone, any of these kinds of thinking, God is never going to be anywhere near you. Because you see, none of those things that I touch and still, he came to deliver me. And did he deliver me? There's probably about, at least, if not more, I'm not sure how many. Maybe less, I don't know. All those souls are gone. They're dead. And as I floated away through the air, I knew that I was going to be one of the ones, ones he was saving, the only one actually in that scripture. I know that in some parts it tore me apart and I bawled and I cried and I begged that God not do this. And he kept telling me the sin was not against you. I counted it as against me. And that is why I do what I do, because I have to do what I do according to my word. It has nothing to do with you. But that didn't keep me from fasting and praying that God not, that God change his mind, that God to have a change of heart. But he said it was already too late. They had done the job already. So when you have a complete psalm, a long one, and word for word, and you read the King James Version of it, you see it was word for word, what was in your dream. You can be positive that dream was from God. And it was years later when I really discovered what they all had really done. And when I saw it for what it was, I could hardly believe what had happened. Some were obviously manifested to kill me. Others were doing it and gathering in secret to try and kill me. And the Lord shared something with me. Here's what he said. When somebody finds fault with an innocent person, they rise up against them and they see a mirror of themselves. In other words, when they looked at me, they saw what they were doing. They saw their imagination, they saw their lies, they saw everything of what they were doing. And in their heart, when they saw me, they claimed it was me doing that. And it rose up with a hatred of wanting to destroy me. But the sad part of this whole thing is, because I was innocent, and I wasn't doing that even in the tiniest way, it fell back on them. They, they rose up saw themselves, fought it. Like one told me, I'm so tired of worrying. And she was worrying against herself. Every time she'd think of me, this wall would come up of her, her war, not my war, her war, war. Every time people would imagine that I was doing certain things, they would come up to themselves. And like the Bible says, there are people, like Paul the Apostle said, that wrestle with certain truths to their destruction. But God taught me great big lessons since then. That a person who is really innocent, who is not doing one thing to anybody, to harm anybody, to do anything wrong, uh, they're going to have a lot of enemies because the enemy is going to see to it that they target you. If you're the only one who is truly living the life, the only one who really wants to do the will of God, 
the enemy will see to it that you're targeted and you will be persecuted. And that's part of being a Christian. Lay, yea, and all who will live godly shall suffer persecution. But some of you don't want to go through that. Some of you want delivered now. You see, I went through it in, in that big, huge of a scale with a lot of people, and not just the ones that the amount I mentioned. I went through it for almost 20 years, and then some after that. But some of you, when it happens to you, you fight it, you hate it, you want, you want it down. So you rise up against what you think is your enemy. Now, this is usually people who have made themselves your enemy. And there are several things that cause them to make you their enemy. They will either see God inside of you and know you have him and get so jealous and so envious the way they did Jesus Christ. They will get so envious that they will say to themselves and realize that in order for Jesus to be, they were not. They were hypocrites. They didn't have God. And as long as he was breathing, as long as he was alive, his very life rebuked him. The way he thought, the way he felt, the things he did stirred up envy and hatred. That's why they killed him. They figured that he would, they would get rid of him. I mean, I know of one that the whole world knows is suffering persecution where they're hated because people can see God's hand is on them. And they figure just like the hypocrites and scribes and Pharisees, they figure that, well, you know, uh, if anybody is going to be the son of God, it's going to be me. If anybody's going to have miracles in their life, it's going to be me. Because why, look what I've done. Didn't I do many mighty works in your name? Didn't I cast out demons? Didn't I do these things? And the Lord said, get away from me, ye that work iniquity. Those works weren't iniquity. It was what they were doing in their heart. That was where the iniquity was. A worker of iniquity is a very special breed. They will labor to do harm to a Christian, a true believing Christian. I'm not talking about a hypocrite, a liar, one that sins all week and, and says it's all going to be okay, one that says that it's okay, you can do anything and still be saved. That's not a Christian. That is a, a liar. That is a false prophet. That's not godly. That's not God. He don't teach that. There's too many scriptures in there that tell you the truth that say it's like when you go into sin, back into sin, you're turning. You're like the dog that turns to his own vomit. You're like the person that tramps on the blood and counts it nothing. Well, what does it mean? I'm covered with the blood. I can do anything I want to now. That If I want to kill, I can kill. If I want to rape, I can rape. Hey, I'm still getting into heaven because he died for me. Never realizing you're tramping on the blood. You're tra making the blood of Jesus of no effect. If you can bring the blood of Jesus to a place where it doesn't mean a thing, it means nothing. It, it has no power to save because it saves me and takes me to heaven in the dirtiest, filthiest state, which is not what God wants. For he tells you clearly he's coming back for a bride that is unspotted and unwrinkled. And if you've got one tiny little spot on that garment, he's going to kick you out. Because he knows he cleansed you. He knows that Jesus Christ died for you. He understands all that. And you won't be able to lie to him. You won't be able to fool him. You won't be able to pretend and some of them, you use your state of affairs, the, the way you are, as your excuse. Well, I can't. I couldn't. Well, you know what? What happened to me when I was little brought me to this place. No, it didn't. What brought you to this place, if it's wrong, is your choice. Because if it were true, 
that that what happened to you were little when you were little is the reason why you're doing a sin today. And I'd have been the worst sinner because a lot happened to me when I was little. It never made me envious with anybody. It never made me covet. It never made me deliberately lie or cheat or steal or deny others. It never made me do those things. Because nothing can make you do anything that you don't want to do. For you have a free will that God gave you. And that free will gives you the freedom and power of choice. So when you choose to do evil, you have nobody else to blame but yourself. And if you never accept that and take that before God honestly, I mean, <laughs> you think I didn't have to do that? I had to face myself as I was, not as I wanted to be. I had to face myself as he let me know I was. He wasn't over there with a hammer trying to hammer me. He would just let me know straight out, Marion, this is wrong. It's not me. Don't go there. <clears throat> and then he would lead me into prayer on how to get rid of it. But was he condemning me? <clears throat> no, only the enemy would do that. Was he chastising me and beating on me? No, because when he knew that I was ignorant and didn't know what I was doing, why would he beat on me? Well, some of you uh, fathers and mothers beat on your child because you think you're going to force them into submission, so you beat them. You don't teach them. You don't ever let them express themselves. You don't talk to them. And some of you, they're so foolish, you let them express themselves and do evil to you and dishonor you. You're shortening the life of your children because you're not teaching them to honor thy father and thy mother. You're teaching them, well, you know what? Look at that kid. He's just like me. He's swearing. Oh, did you see that? He's saying the four-letter word. And you see my little girl, how she just does this to me all day long and how the one that sits there and goes like this because he's angry and he doesn't want anything to do with you and you teach that to them you're teaching them dishonor you are teaching no wonder some of you shut off the comments because somebody just somebody might tell you the truth that that is a type of abuse when you encourage a child to do wrong to their own parents that is a form of abuse that you're going to answer for. The child may not answer it. It may fall right on you. Some of you have the attitude, no man is going to tell me how to live. No woman is going to teach me anything. Have at it. Because God's not really particularly up there wringing his hands that, oh, James won't listen to me, and and Daniel just hates me, and and uh, Bobby just this, and and Sally is just this way. I don't know what I'm going to do with them. They're uncontrollable. They just have demanded this and demanded that, and they have just played and played and played, and they think because they go to church, everything is erased when they don't even know the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. But he's wringing his hands trying to find a way to save you when you don't want him. When you show him that you don't want him and you reject him repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly, after a while, he finally says, okay, they really don't want me. They've proved it to me. He will walk away. He says, I will not always strive with men. So play all you want. Oh, some of you are so smart. Some of you know so much about the word that you even brag. Well, I know that's the right way. And I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know why I won't obey. I know what you're saying. God told me all of that already. God told me this is the way it is. This is the way he wants it. And I just don't understand why I won't go there. Like you're so ignorant that you think that he's going to change his word for you. The fear of God has never come upon you. Those of you who think you're so mighty and you're so high and you pray the fear of God on somebody, 
I'm going to tell you the first place the fear of God is going to come is going to be on you. When you pray for uh, revenge and all of that, the first place you're going to be visited is you. Hatred doesn't eat up that other person. It eats you up. Resentment doesn't eat, eat them up. It eats you up. Lies don't eat them up. It eats you up. You get devoured by the one that goes to and fro seeking whom he may devour. Instead of pulling his teeth out and letting him know, no, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to hurt the Lord like that. Or even be afraid and keep your fear of God before your eyes. Oh, well, you know, you couldn't have meant for us to protect our eyes like that. Look at all this nudity around us. You have to say there is no way that you can't stop. Look at look at us, Lord. Look at what they're doing. Look at where they're tempting me. Look at where they're making me look. No. No one makes you look. He gave you the power to put your eyes down. He gave you the power to lower your eyelids. He gave you the power to look straight ahead. And when you see that immediately, and you go on, you don't let it enter into your mind. You don't, don't let the memory linger. You don't let the image touch you. If you're holy, that's the way you'll be. But if you're a demon out of hell, and you enjoy sin, and you like lying, you lie to yourself. You'll look at it and enjoy it, and then you go, oh, God, don't want me to do that. Oh, Lord, forgive me. Well, oh, Lord, I know I shouldn't have done it. Forgive me. <laughs> like as though he's deceived that he didn't see you fully engage in it, fully entertain it, and fully conceive it in the heart. You see, like he said, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out. So what comes out? Murder, fornication, adultery, all of those things. They come out of your heart. So in your heart, you see somebody and you resent them. And you want to kill them. That's murder. I mean, you want to get a hold of them and you want to just crush them. So you pray that God take a hold of them and just completely destroy them. Well, in your prayer closet, filled with dead men's bones, where you ripped and tore them so apart, all that's left is their bones. Well, that's the kind of prayer closet you want. You don't have God listening to you, that's for sure. But what do you have? You have a demon that comes, and he answers all your prayers. And, oh, look, look at how God dealt with that one. Oh, well, they'll, know, they'll know better than to try to ever touch me again. They'll know better than to ever do that again. The only one that is ever going to learn this no better is you. You have chosen the evil path, not the path of holiness, not the righteous path. You forget that Jesus Christ is the king of righteousness and he will always do what is right. He will never change it for a moment. He will never destroy for you. He will never hate for you. He will never get involved in your offenses where you choose to become offended over someone with the hopes that God makes them pay. That's, that's what you do. You know where God says that the wicked seek after a sign. They want to, I want to know you're with me. Show me a sign, Lord. He said, the only sign you get is Jonah. Well, what did Jonah do? Jonah knew if he went to Nineveh, the whole town would repent. And he did not want them to find, to find God. He wanted to be the only one that had God. So when God called him to go and preach, he ran away. Because he, he did not want to see any one of them saved. I mean, this is what God's saying to you. 
You don't want to do what is right because you don't want to see them repent because you want to be the only one that has anything. So what did he do? He found himself in the belly of the whale, which I really believe. And when God spit him out, do you honestly think he repented? As he sat under that tree, what were God's last words to him? You had more compassion on that gourd than you did on the people of Nineveh. Because as soon as they heard the truth, they all fasted and prayed and repented. But you see, there's many of you that don't want to see that. You want to be the only one that has the gospel. You want to be the only one that has anything. You want everybody to see how you pray and how great you are and how you have everything. This pride is so wicked and it's so wrong. You want to go to church and you, oh, well, I talked this one into coming and look, look what I brought to church. And, and uh, well, you know. <laughs> And the pastor lifts you up that you're the greatest witness there is. And you go, oh, you know, look what he's saying about me. I'm not all that. You better believe you're not. In the sight of God, you're nothing. You've made yourself nothing. You've made yourself worse than nothing. Because your purpose to bring souls into Christ is not to bring them to Jesus to get saved. You don't want them saved. It's to use them. To use them to say you're something. Like the man, I think his wife called me up. And he always used to put uh, real nice comments on my videos. And his wife called me and told me what he was really doing. Now, he was right there listening to her tell me. So, I mean, this was not done in the dark. I mean, this was a very wise woman. She was more godly than this man could ever claim. But he thought because he went down and helped the neighbor fix her bike and helped them buy this and helped them do that, that he was permitted to treat everybody in his family like none of them could ever have God. He was the only one. And this almost drove her nuts because when you see somebody doing that much evil and then they try to put you under their thumb and they try to bring you down. She was a very wise woman. I really enjoyed talking to her because she was so much on the ball for Jesus Christ compared to him. And <laughs> I have to laugh because whenever he got on the phone, you talk about yelling. I told him the truth and my, my voice raised. And when it raised, it raised with power the way I have rebuked some demons in the past. It wasn't flesh. I told you before, I would be right there at the, a prayer meeting with five women. And all would be concentrating and praying on for someone to be healed. And the woman stepped that sat, stood right next to me, spoke th through a demon. And I'm over here praying, and I turned around and looked and said, shut up, like that. And it just immediately shut up. But not one woman heard me yell that loud. Not one. The only one that heard me was the demon, and I won't even tell you that the woman that had the demon heard it, or even felt it, or even knew it. Because sometimes God raises his voice. Sometimes God calls him out and says, shut up. Sometimes God has to deal harsher by driving the money changers out of the church. Sometimes he has to tell them, my house shall be called a house of prayer, and you have made it a den of thieves. So whatever they were buying and selling, they were cheating people. Oh, I've been accused of my, <laughs> that uh, I was upset with a certain woman 
uh, pastor because she was told by a false prophet that I said that she was blaspheming the Holy Spirit because she would not sell my book in church. And that conversation between her and I never happened. See, I got a witness. His name is Jesus Christ. He wrote that book. I got a witness. I did not do what that man said I did. I could remember talking to him and I could remember him grasping a hold of that into the air and feeling it. And God's telling me, don't touch it. Let him go. I could feel he was going to go run and do it. I didn't do it. I was innocent. And God said, no, don't defend yourself. Let him go. He even told me, Marion, this sin of what these people did is so bad that I don't want you to talk to anybody about it. I don't want you to tell anybody about it. I don't even want you to say hello to them. I want you to go into prayer and fast for three days over this. That's all I want. And after that, if you see them on the street, don't acknowledge anything. Stay away from them. That is their sin. Leave it there. It was part of, of this group of people that finally wound up accusing me of things that I wasn't doing. But they had so much witchcraft among themselves to make it look like to them I was doing it. I could feel it. I could see it. I knew what they were doing to me. And there was nothing that I could do. But you know what? I had worse than that against me. Now, I'm not saying that you have to go through that, but I am saying, yea, and all who will live God godly shall suffer persecution. For it is in persecution that you build up your character, build up your strength, build up everything in God that you need. I have seen so many visions that that dream that I had for a lot of years, I marveled because I had never heard of having a dream word for word according to the King James Version of the Bible and then see God deliver me. Because there is a part of the word that says that you'll look for your enemy and they're gone. And I did. I looked around and, hey, that one's gone. That one's gone. There's nobody to trouble me here anymore. There's nobody to lie on me anymore. They're all in the grave. I didn't move them and I didn't pray it. But they're still there that are, are determined they are going to pull me down. So I have to laugh because it's not going to happen. I don't care what kind of trick you think you use. I don't care how you think God is with you. I don't care how you took the word and you turned it into what you wanted. I don't care how you did it. I'm innocent before God. You're in trouble. And I am innocent before God because God doesn't expect me to please you. He doesn't expect me to be like you. He doesn't expect me to do any of those things. He expects me to be what he created and the person he brought forth out of me. That's what he expects me to do. He expects me to stand there and not pick up all of your lies and your teachings. 